about choices. 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 One of the certainties of life is that each one of us will make choices. Each one of us. Some of the choices we make are automatic. We make them without thinking of them. If you are dressing up in the morning, you don't think of which arm goes into which sleeve of the shirt. You know the right arm goes to the right sleeve. You don't think, should it, is that for the left or to the right? It's automatic. You do that. You put your legs into your trouser. You don't put the trouser on top of your head. So these are automatic choices. You don't think about them, but you make them. But there are choices that you have to be conscious about and conscious of because they have consequences and they will play back in your life. You have to choose several things and for you to be in the meeting today there will be several choices you have made. It is said that averagely the hum every human being makes about 10,000 or more choices a day. Most of them are made without thinking but some of them you think. You have to think about when to get up this morning, whether to get up at the time you felt like getting up or later on. You have to choose when to have your bath, and I hope that you did. <laughs> have to choose whether to brush your teeth or not, what to wear to church, and so on and so forth. These are choices. What is a choice? A choice is an act of selecting or making a decision when faced with two or more possibilities. An act of selecting or making a decision when faced with two or more possibilities. In other words, you cannot make a choice if all you have is one thing in front of you. So for there to be a choice, there has to be options, options, and there have to be preferences. If you're going to make a choice, there has to be more than one, options, and preferences, what you like. Life is simpler without options. When you have no option, you have no choice. You have to deal with what is before you. If you're a slave, life is simple because you have no choice. If you're a beggar, you have no choice. It's a simple life. A slave and a beggar have no choice. But if you want to live beyond a slave and a beggar, you must have a choice. And you have to exercise that choice. If you go to, if you want to eat, and you go to the local food vendor, and you go to that vendor and he has only one meal, maybe pounded yam and some stew, and it's only one stew, and you go to buy food from that person, you have no choice because you know that this is the only thing that is served there. So you go with your money, you buy your meal, because there's no choice. And normally when you go to a place where they serve only one meal, a food vendor who sells only one meal, you, make, you buy and leave the place very quickly. However, when you go to a restaurant and you go to the buffet table and there's a lot of food, on display, you have options and you spend a lot of time there. Because the moment you are faced with options, life becomes complicated. And most of us would wish that people would make choices for us or that we don't have to compare uh, between 
two things, especially when you like both and you have to choose only one. Life becomes complicated with choices. The reality of life is that God created us to make choices. And he expects us to make choices. So let's look at a few scriptures to set us on our way. The final instruction or part of the final instructions that Moses gave to Israel is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 30 verse 19 to 20. Moses is giving the final instructions to Israel. And this is what he says. I call heaven and earth to as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may have life, that you may love the Lord the, your God, obey his voice, cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have set before you life and death, choices, choices. So right from the Old Testament we see choices. Then we come to the New Testament and we look at Jesus Christ. He had to make choices too. Luke chapter 22 verse 41 to 43. This is when Jesus is going to the cross and he has to decide whether to go or not to go. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says that he was withdrawn from them. Luke 22, 41 to 43. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Jesus had to make choices. Israel had to make choices. Jesus had to make choices. And then we go to the end of the Bible. I'm just showing you that from the beginning to the end, choices have to be made. The end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, almost the final instructions in the Bible. And we read, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. That's a choice. The water of life is not going to be forced to anybody. Salvation is free, but it's not by force. It's not compulsory. You have life and death. So from the beginning, we see choices. In the life of Jesus, we see choices. At the end of the Bible, we see choices. God created every human being with a free will. A free will. He also created us with a conscience to know right and wrong. And he created us to do his will willingly. The whole theology of judgment is based on choices. Because if God is going to judge you, at the end of time, it presupposes that there has to be a basis. If you have no choice, you cannot be judged. If we were created and programmed just to function in one way, there is no judgment. The reason you're going to judge is because God is going to set before you options and He's going to judge your choice. So choices will be evaluated in the end. And that's very important. So, when you read through the Bible, there is the concept of choice built into the scripture. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the three big choices you have to make in your life. Those were the first three choices Adam had to make. When God created Adam, he had to make three important choices. And I want to suggest to you that you have to make those choices too. There are three big choices everybody has to make in life. So we're going to run through the three 
top choices of your life. The first big choice you have to make is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The first important choice everybody has to make is to choose what you feed on. To choose what you feed on. God created us in his image, but you have to choose what you feed on. Adam was given the option to determine what he was going to feed on, either from the tree of life, that is to feed on life, or to feed on good and evil. Now, when the Bible talks about feeding here, it's not just food for the body. The feeding here is what you allow into your system. You have to choose what you allow into your system. You have to choose the words you allow into your system. You have to choose what you hear. You have to choose what you read. You have to choose the words that you come into contact with. If you feed yourself a diet of hatred, you will be hateful. If you feed yourself a diet of fear, you will be fearful. If you feed yourself a diet of lust, you will be lustful. If you feed yourself a diet of love, you will be loving. If you feed yourself a diet of faith, you will have faith. If you feed yourself a diet of holiness, you will be holy. So you have to choose what you feed on. Nothing will be forced into your system. The most important thing we have to be fe feeding on is the words. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 verse 4 when Satan uh, tempted him, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus Christ himself said his flesh was food and his body was food. You have to choose what you feed on. As you go out into the world, you watch television, you listen to the news, you read books, there are newspapers. The TV will not watch you. TV does not watch you. You watch TV. The radio does not listen to you. You listen to it. And if there is junk coming from the TV and you feed on the junk, you will be junk. When there is fear coming from radio and you feed on it, you will be full of fear. Whatever you feed on will become you. Because you are what you eat. The option to feed is left to you. You decide what you want to feed on. You decide the kinds of things you want to put into your system. You decide the words you want to listen to. I remember years ago I was in, uh, I was in public transport in Accra. This is years ago. I was not a pastor then. And, you know, in, in the transport, uh, I think there were two of us men in the, in the bus, and the rest were women. And the conversation became very lustful and very profane. So, you know, they were talking profanity to each other, and the man was in center stage, and he was talking all the profanity, uh, and, 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 and the women were cheering him up. And I was very quiet, minding my own business. I was, I, after all, I'm stuck in the bus and I can't get down. So, at a point, this man turned to me and said, My brother, what do you think? Now, at this time, he's bringing the food to me. And I said to him, Stupid. He said, You insulting me, stupid? I said, What you're saying is stupid. It nearly brought a fight, but I had to let him know I'm not going to feed on this food. You can serve it all you want, but I choose what I feed on. Are you listening to me? You choose what you feed on. You don't feed 
on words, on information, simply because they are out there. You choose what internet site you visit. That's your choice. You choose what television programs to watch. That's your choice. You choose what movies to watch. That's your choice. If you want to build into integrity, feed yourself stuff that will give you integrity. If you listen to conversations of men cheating on their husbands, you're going to cheat on your wife pretty soon. On men cheating on their wives, you're going to cheat on your wife very soon. If you sit with women who are talking about how to cheat men, you will cheat your man very soon because what you feed on is what you become. Somebody say, I have a choice. That's the first choice Adam had to make. What to feed on. What you allow into your system. We live in a world with so many challenges. I don't want to complicate my problems. If I want to feed on something, I'm going to feed on something that will open my mind. That will open my spirit. If I listen to music, I'm going to listen to music that will elevate my spirit to a higher level. If I'm going to read a book, I'm going to read a book that will give me wisdom and direction. If I'm going to listen to a conversation, I'll listen to a conversation that will equip me for the battles I'm faced with. I have a choice. You have a choice. That's the first choice Adam had to make. What to feed on. The second big choice he had to make is how to call the things that come his way. You have to choose what you eat. You have to choose what you're going to call the things that come your way. Genesis chapter 2 verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Adam did not create the conditions. He didn't create any animal. He's just there minding his business and God arranged these animals in front of him. And he says, you name them. Elephant, that's the name. If you call this one antelope, that's the name. Whatever name you give it, that's what it will be to you. You have a choice how to call the things that come your way in life. In life, you, there are things that will come your way you don't control. You don't control your parents who gave birth to you. You didn't choose your parents, but you have to choose what to call them. You, didn't, you can't control your nationality to a very large extent, but you have to determine how to call it. There are some things that may come your way. It may be trouble. It may be tragedy. It may be difficulty. But you must determine how you call it. When I was, when I was a young boy, at the age of 15, my mother died. The next year, at the age of 16, my father died. I had to choose what I would call myself. If I call myself orphan, I'm going to be orphan for life. If I call myself a man after God's heart, I'm going to pursue the heart of God for the rest of my life. And I remember the first prayer I prayed when I was told my mother was, was, was dead because my mother was a really prayerful woman. And this is what I prayed. The first prayer I prayed, I said, Father, from now onwards, you are everything to me. I'm not going to tell my mother my prayer topics. I'm going to come to you directly and I'm going to talk to you about my needs. I realize what you call the things that come your way is up to you. If you call yourself a failure, that's what it's going to be. If you lose your job and you call yourself jobless, that's what you've described yourself and so shall it be. You may lose your job. You may lose money. You may go through tragedy, but whatever comes your way, you have a choice how to label it. Because the label you put on your experiences will brand your experiences in your memory and in your lifetime. You have a choice what to call the things that come your way. If you were born in a gutter 
and you call yourself gutter child, that's your choice. But you can be born in the gutter and you can say taking out of the gutter, child of the king, a prince with a promise, a man of destiny. Although you were born in a gutter, you can call yourself and your experience a training ground for greatness. You have a choice how you label the things that come your way. And so God brings these animals to Adam, and Adam has a choice. He has to determine what he's going to call them. The label you allow to be placed on you will stick on you. You cannot rise beyond the way you see yourself. Because you live your life according to the label you choose to wear. If you wear the label of weak, you will be weak. If you wear the label of poor, you will be poor. Because poverty is not a financial condition. It's a mental state. It's a mental state. If you're in a state of mental poverty, money can be poured to you, you dissipate it. It's not lack of money, it's lack of ideas. Poverty of ideas is far more severe than poverty of money. I would rather have no money in my pocket and a lot of ideas in my head, but I will never call myself poor. My mother was a very great Christian, but she came from the old school. And she used to tell me, remember, we are poor. And she said it with a lot of conviction. We are poor. And I remember the first time in Ghana, secondary school is normally boarding school. And I remember the first time I was going to secondary school, I was about 12 years old, at boarding school, secondary form one. And my mother called me and said, remember where you're coming from. We are poor. And when you go out there and the rich people's children are talking, be quiet. Because we are poor. So I went to secondary school, I was in Form 1. And uh, the school, you know, the food they were feeding us at the dining hall uh, was not good to, to the students. Not to me, but to the students. Because they were giving us fried cassava and uh, sardines, tin sardine, which is not bad, nice food. But the rest of the students said, no, we don't like it, no, we don't like it, no, we don't like it. And I remembered my mother said, remember, we are poor. That's us, we are poor. So I was a Form 1 student, and the seniors, everybody is on strike. They're not going to the dining hall. They're not eating. And I, I went to the dining hall because I remembered we are poor. So I was in the dining hall and, uh, and, uh, and you know, at, at the dining hall table there will be about maybe 20 people at the table. So, well, the food was served. I went to sit at my table and I ate my food. And since there were about 19 more plates, I put my plate away and put the second plate because I remembered we are poor. So I'm eating the second plate, I'm on the third plate and somebody hooks the back of my shirt and says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm eating because my mother said, we are poor. Now, it took me a long time to get rid of that label. Because I had this concept of poverty for so long, so I couldn't use new things. You know, for a long time, if I bought a new shirt, I couldn't wear it. Because every shirt I had worn was old. A new shirt made me uncomfortable. So, when, when I got a new shirt, I would hide the shirt for about a year. And after a year, it would be familiar and old enough for me to wear it. Because somebody told me, we are poor. Poverty mentality 
can be so imprinted on you that even when you have so much money, your mind tells you we are poor. You have to choose how to label your experiences. Choose how to label your experiences. There are people who are always saying, I am tired. I am sick. I don't know. Have you heard people always, almost every sentence, I don't know, but. I don't know, but. I don't know. If you don't know, how are you going to know? If you're poor, how are you going to be rich? If you label yourself tired, how are you going to be strong? The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. God wants you to put a label on yourself that reflects your destiny and not your condition. And you have a choice. Somebody say, I have a choice. You have a choice. You have a choice. It's your choice. If you want to be in defeat, that's your choice. If you want to be above, that's your choice. Abraham was told, go sacrifice your son Isaac. He decided to relabel that instruction. He said, I'm going to the mountain to worship. And me and the boy are coming back. Somebody else would have said, well, this is the last day of your life, Isaac. We're going to the mountain and you'll not see mama again. And you'll not see daddy again. Say goodbye to the dog because you're not coming back to the dog. But he said, we're going and we're coming back. Somebody say, I have a choice. If you call your marriage a prison, it will be a prison to you. If you call your husband a tiger, he will pounce on you. If you call your wife a witch, she will feed on you. You have a choice how to label the things that come your way. Somebody say, I have a choice. If you choose to call Africa third world, you'll be third in everything. And this is the kind of third where there's no fourth. You know, it's like three people running and, 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 and everybody comes to tell their position and one of them comes and says, I was third. How many people were running? Three. What's your position? Third. Now, third world, there's no fourth world. I mean, that, that's it. If you call your condition third world, you will be perpetually at the back. But we choose to be the head and not the tail. We choose to be above only and not be beneath. We choose our language, we choose what we feed on, and we choose how to label the things that come our way. You may not control every experience of your life, but you will control what you call it. The script you accept as your role will determine how you act in life. In Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, there is a character called Jax, and he utters these words in As You Like It. He says, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players, they have their exits and their entrances. And each man in his time plays many parts. If that is so, if the world is a stage, then it means that you act on that stage based on the script that you have in your hand. The other day, I was watching a movie and there was this character in the movie his name is Jim Cavizel and he was playing the role of a crook and I, I, it confused me so how can he be a crook well the script of the movie says he must be a crook but I couldn't take it because this guy was the one who played Jesus in the passion of the Christ. And in my mind, he's Jesus. And he's, he's a crook. One moment, he's Jesus. Next moment, he's a crook. What is controlling his behavior is not himself. It's the script that he has been given. He's been told this is the script 
and he's acting accordingly. For most of us, when we were born, our parents gave us a script and said, we are poor. So you take that script and you get on the stage of life and you can go to university and get degrees upon degrees, but the script says, we are poor. And that's how you're going to act. At a certain point in your life, you have to hand your father's script back to him. And hand your mother's script back to her. And hand, and hand your teacher's script back to him and says, I'm going to write my own script. I choose to label the things that come my way. I'm not going to act your part. I'm going to act my part. I'm going to play the role that God has appointed for me. If God says I'm the head, then I write a script of headship. If God says I'm blessed and highly favored, then I write a script of headship and blessed and highly favored. What script are you acting out? Sometimes life will hand you a script you don't like. And you have to be able to say, no, thank you. You want me to play this role? I'm not going to play it. Because I have another script. I go to the Father and he writes me a new script. And I act my life according to his script. You have a choice what you feed on. You have a choice how you label the things that come your way. And the third big choice Adam had to have, had to make, was he had to choose whom to welcome into his life. You choose whom you welcome into your life. Genesis chapter 2 verse 21 to 23. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. Then he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now God did not force Eve on Adam. God just paraded her and says, That's it. Adam had to make a choice, either to welcome her, him into his life, or her into his life, or reject her. That's his choice. He's not forced to accept her. So when God presents this woman, he makes a choice and says, I want this person in my life. She is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, by my choice, not by the will or in the imposition of God. You have a choice whom you allow into your life. May I just tell you this, that friendship is not by force. Friendship is not by force. And anyone who wants to be your friend by force most likely has an agenda. That is not in your interest. And don't feel bad if somebody wants to befriend you and you don't feel like befriending them now. Because you have to determine who is coming into your life and who is exiting out of your life. Don't open your life to everybody to enter because some people will come to your life and mess you up. When people enter your life, they enter with all that they have and all that they are. If they are wicked, they enter with wickedness. The people you choose to allow into your life. Because when you make a decision, when you're going to consult those people. They are the gatekeepers of your wisdom. If you are a woman, for example, and you, somebody comes to tell you, Well, I saw your husband. Your husband is having an affair with another woman. Sister Margaret, somewhere there. When you hear that information, your heart is going to start boiling. Then you start devising mischief. So all kinds of ideas are going to come into your mind. I'm going to face Margaret and I'm going to spray pepper into her eyes and I'm going to give her dirty slaps. You know, all kinds of ideas are coming through your mind. You're processing them because they said Margaret is having an affair with your husband. You have no proof, but that's what you've heard. Now, after you've processed all your anger, 
You're going to bounce off your idea with whom you have allowed into your life. So you're going to ask somebody close to you and say, this is what I've heard that my husband is doing and I hear Margaret is responsible. What should I do now? If that person is not intelligent, they're going to say, let's go together and let's give her a beating. At that time, you have decided your destiny. Now, if you talk to another person, that person would say, by the way, have you cross-checked? Have you verified? Do you have a second opinion? The person who tells you that will help you to think through. It may be true, it may not be true, but now you have somebody who has given you wisdom to process information right. You have to choose who comes into your life and who exits your life. If you are an angry person, don't get angry people around you. It's a bad combination. It's petrol and fire. If you are temperamental, get a level-headed person. If you're level-headed, get somebody who is more aggressive in life. Because if, if everybody around you is level-headed, you have an idea, they say, this, no, I don't think it will work. I don't think it will work. Because all your friends are afraid to take a risk. So you, you, you have to choose who you bring into your life. Adam chose a woman, the opposite, not another man into his life. A woman. And in the physical sense, that is right. But it also means that most of the people you bring into your life must be people who compliment you. People who compliment you. People who add to your life. People who complete your life. If you bring in everybody who is like-minded like you, there's going to be serious distortion of perception. Because everybody's going to see it the way you see it and nobody gives you the option to see the other side. You have to choose whom you bring into your life. Whom you bring into your life. You have to choose what you feed on. One of the things I have noticed is people normally don't choose what they feed on. Sometimes you ask people, why do you go to a particular church? They say, but it's, it's close to me. So, if, you, if you're hungry, and all the restaurants around your home are selling cockroach fried and, and sautéed cockroach and, and, uh, and uh, parboiled cockroach, and the other is selling uh, kebab cockroach. Now, are you going to say, well, you know, all the restaurants around me sell cockroach and I'm hungry so I'm going to eat it. No, you're going to bypass them and go to where the meal is served to your satisfaction. So if you can do that for a restaurant, why don't you do that for your spiritual food? Why don't you do that? So, if this is where you get fed, if you move away from here, 50 miles, you drive back here because this is where you get fed. You have to choose where you feed. Not based on proximity, but based on your dietary needs. Based on your future aspirations. If you find a church where you are fed, you stay there. You don't allow proximity to determine. You have to choose how you label the things that come your way. Life is going to throw you some tough situations, but you have to label each one of them. And you have to choose who comes into your life. Nobody is going to force themselves into your life. No friendship is by force. Friends get dropped and new friends are made. My best friend at the age of five is not my best friend now. As a matter of fact, I don't even know where he is. My best friend, when I was 12, is not my best friend now. I haven't spoken to him for 30 years. My best friend, when my 20s, is not my best friend now. Because sometimes you outgrow friends. You outgrow them. You can keep them for nostalgic purposes. 
Once in a while, you say, oh, you remember that, you remember that, you remember, and that, that's all your conversation is all. You remember, you remember, you remember. Any conversation that has too much you remember is not productive. Because you don't live life based on the past you remember. It's on the future you are going to. So you have to choose whom you allow into your life. If God brings you a mentor who is good for you, even if he disciplines you, you allow him into your life. Then the praise singer who is going to praise your weaknesses to your downfall. Choose the people you allow into your life. Three big choices that each one of us must work on. The first choice is what? Choose what you feed on. Number two, choose how you call or label the things that come your way. Number three, choose the people you allow into your life. These are the three big choices Adam had to make. And these are the three big choices you've got to make in your life if you're going to be successful. Let's get up on our feet. I want you to just talk to God about these three choices in your life. And I want you to make some choices, some commitments about what you want to feed on, how you label the things that come your way and the kinds of people you're going to allow into your life. Let's lift your hands to heaven and just pray for divine wisdom, guidance, direction in these three areas. Lead us, Lord. What to feed on? Who is going to be my source of feeding? Whose message will I listen to? Whose word will I listen to? Whose books will I read? Whose tapes will I listen to? Whose DVD am I going to watch? What you feed on is going to become your personality. How am I going to call this experience I'm going through? I'm in the valley now. How am I going to call it? Everything is collapsing around me. How am I going to call it? I feel depressed at the moment, but how am I going to call it? Am I going to call it depression? How do you call the things that you're going through? And do an inventory of the people around you. Are they all supposed to be where they are? Is somebody in your inner circle who must move to the outer circle? Wisdom, Lord. Wisdom, Lord. Wisdom, Lord. Wisdom, Lord. To make the right choices. To make the right choices, Lord. Kabo yo sitere in the redabo shaka. Kibai ansandara koshia tarabakoya. God will not make these choices for you. He will not choose for you. You have to make the choices yourself. We pray, Father, tonight for everybody here. But in these three areas, you will guide us and give us the courage to make the choice. To choose what to feed on, to choose what to call the things that come our way, and to choose the people we allow into our lives. May we, O oh God, be guided by wisdom and never to eat that which will poison our souls and our minds and our destiny. Grant us, O oh God, the right vocabulary to speak to the con conditions that you present to us. And grant us, O oh God, the courage to choose the people who come into our lives and the people who exit our lives. And we vow, O oh God, to be responsible with these three choices. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give God...